Reese is the only person I've ever had like a physical altercation with, as he told you about. It. No. <laughs> Let's go! More <laughs> details! This is your soundbite for Instagram. Yes. I had a fight with Reese Wilson. <laughs> <laughs> we were very young and it was over a girl. I'm stoked to bring you this conversation with Ennis Graham. Ennis grew up racing downhill World Cups and is now a professional mountain bike coach for Dirt School. But he's also a world level enduro racer who clocked a heroic podium last year at the Tweed Valley EWS. Ennis's friends will all say that he's annoyingly multi-talented. Anything he seems to turn his hand to, he does to a high level, whether that's mountain biking, BMX, coaching, photography, videography, or music. He's endlessly creative and he's just an absolute powerhouse. So thanks for tuning in. I'm hoping to maintain the momentum of these podcasts. So if you enjoy what you hear, show some support and hopefully we can keep making them relatively consistently. And um, by the way, just like pull yourself like super close to the mic like as close as you mic check mic you check this was supposed to be bars <laughs> <laughs> when i'm on a mic when i'm on a mic when i'm on a mic <laughs> brilliant uh we're rolling oh, so shit. I'm, oh shit i'm trying oh, to upload, upload i'm nervous i'm nervous. trying to upload my burial but your what my burial oh your burial you you doing that you real you real i'm so real <laughs> <laughs> i want to do some context as well as how we know each other oh my goodness um it's i don't know <laughs> well Thanks. i mean i'll explain because <laughs> mm, okay. we knew about you before you knew about us for sure and it was all through glenn thompson mm. and his fine works of art that okay. he did uh, did with you in the beginning <laughs> you remember shooting those videos what was that like yeah i can't even remember how i know glenn it's probably through callum um yeah i did two videos with Glenn back in probably the first one was 2013 and then another one a couple of years later maybe the next year that was in that was when I first signed a pro contract with Mondraker so you're you're on Mondraker it's a big hype thing there's two videos that come out there's there's home homelands and back home yeah it was all about being home always at home <laughs> <laughs> and uh, both of those videos were hammers that I would highly recommend that people watch. Mm. Reese actually told me that this was like the the first one was one of like the videos that he just watched over and over again. I was like, what? Really? And that was sick to hear. But yeah, uh, I remember at the time we were riding flats as well. And you did that squash off of like a boardwalk thing at Falkland. Yeah. <laughs> and you like the bike was weighted away from you. And then you pull in and again. you pulled it in. And I and just then... remember that looking so sick. And we used to call you without even knowing you. We used to call you the Greyhound. Because you just no fucking way. pedaled everywhere, bro. Yeah, it was, uh, it was a strange one. <laughs> I don't pedal that much anymore. Patience is key, I think. Have you uh, watched those recently? No, not really. No. They're fucking sick, bro. I love them. I was definitely proud of those two videos. Glenn smashed it, and I've always loved Glenn's work. But I think it was uh, probably the first semi-high production video I ever filmed, and it was like, obviously a massive turning point in my career of being on a, a factory team and like feeling pro um and to be able to look back on those videos is mint i guess it's it is cool hopefully youtube doesn't implode one day and, and they're gone forever i don't it'll think it'd should... be good to show the grandkids or something eh? yeah, the but... grandkids. <laughs> youtube's not going anywhere but um no like so we initially that's how i discovered glenn thompson mm. and you as well because you was you glenn was the only guy around in scotland doing like some some actual like cinematography yeah um yeah true there was scott mcpherson yeah yeah do you remember scott yeah roughly and then studs uh, studs or, or was studs a yeah. little bit later shredder yeah. shredder would have been he would have been earlier almost i think mm. But Glenn came in with the, the slider, you know. For sure, and then he was like a little bit slow-mo. I remember he had this app called Twixter or something. Yeah. That did that, that horrible slow-mo. <laughs> Gross looking back at it now with like no, this, this mad setup. But <laughs> yeah, he was definitely pushing the limits back then, I think. It was yeah. Sick. So it's just sick. Because like, we're, we're working together now. We're essentially like, we're like business mm -hmm. married. <laughs> <laughs> There's worse people to be married to. Yeah, he's the G man. <laughs> While we were filming Racing Code the Love, we had some funny times. Oh, that was a brilliant shoot. Uh, day that, four. Yeah, Racing Code the Love, I've got that on here as well. Get to that. 
<clears throat> um, that whole shoot was meant. Mm-hmm. I guess we could we could start there. Like, I mean, the video titles "Racing Killed the Love" and true, true. Yeah. I well, racing was a huge part of my life all the way up until 2016 when I broke my femur and basically just had had enough. Yeah, racing, racing killed the love. Like mm-hmm. that video, I think I just watched it today. It was it's a it's a really sick video and. It was amazing how mm-hmm. we got that opportunity with Radon. We were mm-hmm. both on Radon, riding for Radon at the same time. Yeah. Um, they'll just let us do what we want. It's where, do we, where do we start with that? So so I'd obviously stopped racing. I was racing World Cups in my second year elite, 2016. I took some time off, did some other activities, BMX, worked a full-time job. And then G Milner who most of you will probably be aware of for his YouTube success, his dream build videos. He put something on Instagram looking for a rider that wasn't sponsored to feature in one of his dream build videos. Here's me not ridden a mountain bike in three years. I was like, hey man, I'll do it. Me and G have filmed with each other before. He was like, sick, get to Sheffield next weekend and we'll do it. I was like, oh, all right. (laughs) So I drove down to Sheffield. And I had a flipping nightmare actually getting down because I filled my car up in the morning at like 5 a.m., half asleep, and I put petrol in it when it's a diesel. Oh, man. <laughs> Stitch up. Nightmare. So, so it took me about 12 hours to get to Sheffield when it should have taken about four and a half or five because I had to get my fuel tank drained. And then, oh, anyway, nightmare. Got to G's. We went straight out filming. Um, filming that video, it was, it was meant, it was weird being on a, mountain bike again it was the first time i've ever ridden a 29er mm, so yeah. i actually watched that a couple of weeks ago and i was i just look so uncomfortable on the bike man because it's so weird being even on a... that video that we made i was like you look so much sharper like that vital raw that just came out oh it's night and day isn't it yeah it's like literally mad <clears throat> um but yeah after that video went out radon actually messaged me on instagram and they were like hey man we see that you used to race and you don't have a bike and you, you're not racing anymore. Like fill us in with the story. So I basically gave them a rundown of, of my career up until that point. And I was just like over the racing and stuff. And they were like, well, if you want the bike, you can just keep it. Mm. G paid me a little bit for, for doing that video for featuring in it, which was mint. But then to be given a bike off the back as well from a, from a company, which seemed really sick, to be honest, I was like, heck yeah, I'd be stupid not to. So, so for that year, I rode for Radon just casually. Like, there was no contract or anything, but got some really cool opportunities from from being give, being gifted that bike. The main one being that it gave me the opportunity to go from being fully employed at a restaurant to then calling it a day with that job and getting the job that I'm in now, which is being a full-time mountain bike coach. Um, if I hadn't been given that bike, I would have never been able to afford a new bike and then obviously get that job. So mad, pretty cool. Now looking back, like without radon, it would have been a whole different story in my life. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and through that, you kind of put me in contact with Ingo because I think I was like, "You want to make something?" Yeah. I can't remember exactly how it went, but Ingo, shout out to Ingo. Shout out. Was <laughs> managing uh, yeah. Radon. He was just an absolute legend. Just yeah, because Ingo was market manager, I think, and he was the guy who would obviously message me on Instagram. So instantly to be recognized by someone like that and then being gifted that bike and just being like, yeah, go go do your thing. And then a year later, we actually signed a, like a, a signed a contract with, with a really sick deal at the time. Um, had we filmed... By the time then, because when you signed a contract with him as well and were representing Radon, is that when we were... Uh, my dates like get tw- muddled. It was but. 2020, it was like March, because I remember the contract went through like March. So I reckon yeah. March 2020, yeah, I signed a contract. I don't mm-hmm. know about yourself. I think you were start of the year. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. But that was amazing because the, fr- the freedom involved there was just brilliant, like... We can just do whatever we want. Yeah, well, we said that in the video. Like, Radon were just honestly like, here's some budget, go do whatever you want. And I think they were really stoked with what we came up with. Yeah. What you came up with, so. Yeah. 
you remember the evolve video as well it's, an, it's another uh just did some, the e-bike one yeah yeah i watched that today i was like that's, that's all right i'm normally just cringe at all the old work mm. but like, i think i think that's that's quite cool but i think like everything that you do is is learning right so everything that you do goes into the pot of progression and like you can look back and be like oh my god that's disgusting but without that you would not be where you are now so totally it's like a balance as well of being like super hypercritical of yourself and mm. almost you sometimes need to let your let yourself enjoy what you've done sometimes true story because i'm like i'm that guy that's just like hyper self-critical mm -hmm. i've always like been like that for everything that i've done like even with like riding or yeah. whatever it's, it was supposed to be fun and you just end up like criticizing the clips that you're getting or whatever and comparing them mm. Yeah, so it's a certain level of productivity there though like that sort of nervous like not settling energy is like it's productive but only up until a point and why are you doing it if you're not enjoying it you know yeah true story i think you've just got to like at a certain point just put yourself out there this is something i'm kind of like going through at the moment as well i want to start a youtube channel yes I'm... i was gonna ask you about this <laughs> but i'm so nervous to like to put myself out there yeah yeah but it's the day and age where like man everybody's you've got such a valuable tool in your pocket and i've had feedback from a number of people like dude you should you should vlog i don't want to be the vlogger but i want to be able to like share some cool memories and and hopefully add value to to me as, as a brand if you think about it like that um i think we're kind of similar in that like there's a certain standard that we hold ourselves to that's it so even the word vlog it, it's like, you know, Bernard Caracol and his vlog, like an LSD, yeah. you know, lifestyle documentary. It's like yeah. everybody wants to pretend like they're not vlogging, it's but all it means is a video log, log of the day. You know what I mean? It's it's mm -hmm. kind of just this weird stigma with it. And that's definitely something I thought about with this, like, form factor of long yeah. form. Yeah. For me, it's really hard because I'm, like, always, like, meticulously arranging totally. things to, like, the absolute detail and cutting loads of stuff out and really compressing <laughs> it, whereas this, obviously, by nature... You have to just let it go. Yeah. So I feel like it's a really good exercise for me to just let it go. But I was going to say this because on the Road <laughs> to EWS video, mm -hmm. um, which is absolutely grossly underviewed, so go and watch it. Uh, the Road to EWS with Ennis Graham is a fantastic video. It's up on the Dirt School YouTube channel. Um, Filmed and produced by myself. Yeah, exactly. It's like, <laughs> Unedited. It's so good. Um, but yeah, that, that really that. shows where you're at mm. currently. It's, it's, a, it's a much more current story because maybe people have watched the Race and Killed the Love video. Yeah, sure. Maybe they've watched some other stuff, but like, what have you been up to recently? So that explains it. And it's such a great video. But one of some of my favorite parts of that, um, I noticed, was just like you spraffing on the GoPro, like raw, like to the marshals yeah. and stuff. Yeah, and yeah, start, yeah. It's like, oh, yeah, how's, how's it going? Like, you know, just absolutely normal stuff like i feel like i could watch that all day of somebody attempting to mm. to and especially you at the the level and the stakes and the local race and everything like that it was just such a brilliant watch so i was gonna say that you should start a vlog so it's so funny you i've got episode one and two on my desktop like no episode, way. episode two That's but sick. so with that um road to ews video obviously i tried to film that with a reasonably high level like i have a good camera i'm sure we'll talk about my passion for photography and stuff i just don't see how with such a hectic schedule that i have putting youtube vlogs out to that level would be possible and like like you said such having such attention to detail and high standards for anything that has your name on it as a creative person mm. it's really hard to like just hold a gopro and chat or whatever but I think it's you need to strike a fine balance. Gregor, who's one of my closest friends and flatmate, I, I, um, I came through for breakfast one morning. I was like, Greg, I'm starting a vlog. He was like, what? <laughs> I was like, yeah. And I was talking to him. I'm like, how do you think I should do it? Just, just like phone footage, like my my TV. Like all that is up until this year, I think. Maybe you'll up the production level. and But everything's just been shot on, on a phone. Mm. And that's sick and it's raw and whatever. It's it's true to life. But I think that is like vlog, right? Yeah. And I don't want to be a vlogger. So I want to like somehow supplement that phone footage with 
with nice DSLR or like Sony footage. But then it's like, man, that's going to be so hard. What with racing and working and stuff. So I figure it out. I've got no affiliation with GoPro whatsoever, but mm. they do a good job. The, I mean, it's got to the point where you, you're not being taken away from the immersion. Mm. Whereas before, you know, it would swap to a GoPro clip. Even in some of the old Glenn Thompson videos that we're talking about, it would swap to a GoPro yeah. clip and you would be pulled out of the immersion because the quality was that much lower. Yeah, sure. Whereas now it kind of just looks like reality and people are so like used to seeing GoPro footage that it doesn't take you out of the story. Like It's so funny for us because there is always that that balance. I mean, you see Jobo from Steel City Media, shout out to Jobo. <laughs> um he had an iPhone on the top of his camera. No way. Yeah, and for some of it, he was just filming on iPhone because he was just like, well, it's, it's what just people want. Good. Like, it's good. It's 4K, 60, whatever you yeah, want. Yeah, it's like it looks, lot of numbers. looks good. We can put it out quickly. It's already yeah. on my phone, mm-hmm. you know? So it's kind of, it's True. getting to that stage, but you've, you've got to differentiate between like doing a proper massive film. It's like going through the process of budgeting mm-hmm. for a, a, a film that is meant to contribute to society at large like you're trying to communicate something that's going to last forever Mm. it's like as a filmmaker it's like it's definitely worth up and up it to that sort of next level so it lives forever Mm -hmm. it's not dated but for stuff for athletes and that'll be really difficult for you to let go of yeah but for for day-to-day athletes and people that are trying to just get sponsored they absolutely would just recommend getting a a gopro not to i think yeah um and because i watch vlogs almost daily i know you pay attention to what you watch and you're like this isn't like Mm. and that's what i want to create i want to use youtube as if you think of you think of instagram as like basically a dump for for cool stuff that you're doing in your life i like to look back on my instagram like oh damn remember that or look at this or it's like a a back catalog of of your life really and i want to use youtube as that i don't want it to be just a sole place where i dump vlogs i want it to be any creative video project that I've done, maybe yearly slideshows of my best photography work, maybe some music mixes and stuff. I want it to be just anything creative that I'm doing, throw it in there to be able to look back on in five years and be like, damn, remember that? Or just like we have videos on YouTube from years ago, but it would be cool for it to just be like my own wee personal project. Mm. So that's the plan. Um, I think the battle with YouTube is being consistent, right? And if you want to grow a channel, you need to be somewhat consistent. Maybe at first I'm going to just accept that it's not going to be consistent. But when it starts to gain a little bit of traction and maybe things things evolve, then I'll be definitely motivated. It's exciting. YouTube's a, a very important tool that I don't think a lot of athletes utilize to the best of their potential. It's scary as well, as you said, and you're quite an ex- an expressive person. Like you seem quite mm. confident. So that how many mountain bikers do you know that are are just kind of socially awkward? Do you know what I mean? It's in our nature, the way. That's why yeah. you ride bikes. Yeah. You just don't want to be in a social situation. You want to just get away from. For Richie Rude, man. Yeah, I feel yeah. sorry for that dude, because. I think he's just genuinely so shy. Yeah, and imagine being like at the forefront of your sport being thrown in front of a camera and stuff it must have been really tough for him to learn how to deal with that mm. i don't know i don't know richie personally but i've had a number of conversations and we've obviously we used to race world cups together we yeah. went to world champs in 2012 or whatever 2013 um so like yeah it's been cool actually spending time with richie i'm sure we'll get to that this year you okay. could see why people like that would get into the enduro side of things as well because it really is like you're in your own bubble like even yeah. just watching that road to ews video you're you're like you actually just are at the top of a mountain on your own almost there's like a marshal there yeah. <clears throat> um but then the cool thing about that video was when you started your race run and the support insane what was that like because that must have been a while since you felt something like that i don't think i've ever felt something like that i've obviously raced fort william as a as a scottish rider and stuff but at that time i wasn't really that recognized and coming into that tweed valley first race i wasn't a recognized rider in fact nobody really knew who i was but I won that pro stage and then instantly holy crap it was mad um and it was it was more motivating i didn't feel any more pressure i've said it to a couple of people it's like i just wanted to bring it home for the for the fans 
for like all the kids that I've coached that that previous year, like giving me high fives at the top of every stage and stuff. It was insane. Um, I mean, it was so motivating, and it's made me definitely hungry for more. I guess. It was so cool to see mm. you, man. Like I, I was, I didn't really. I must admit, I don't really check the EWS religiously. Mm. I'm so enveloped in the downhill scene that I almost. Like, I just feel like I don't have time when we're on the road, like, just trying to cover the downhill stuff. Yeah. But for that race, I knew you were racing. Mm. So I was, like, checking the stuff, and I was like, no fucking way. It. <laughs> and this is Dude one just flipping won the pro stage. Absolutely. Funny unreal. story, actually. So Jesse must have been the last rider down, maybe mm. the second last rider or whatever. So I'd gone fastest, and then I was, I think, 61 or something. So the top 50 riders come through. And then one of my friends said that when Jesse came across the line, he was like, who the fuck is in this Graham? <laughs> and I was like, yes. Humble flex. So good. Yeah. No, but stuff like that is insane, eh? Um, just mind-blowing. Back to the kind of uh, Racing Called the Love video. Mm. In that, you went to ride BMX because there wasn't a correct way to ride. Has Enduro allowed a bit more space than the downhill racing and is that why you're kind of vibing it with it at the moment like what is the what is drawing you in the enduro direction all right so i was thinking about this when i was driving over um when i stopped racing downhill and started getting a, a passion for bmx I progressed very quickly with that with that sport and that, that the discipline, I guess, um, to the point where I guess I got sponsored as like a, a flow rider in BMX. That's what you'd be called at the level that I got to. Basically, you'd be flowed part. So you, from the distribution company, IMG, they gave me a frame and they gave me some tires and like a, basically a full bike, which is insane. And I progressed really quickly with this. To the point where, like, we we traveled to to California and met some some of my idols, I guess, in that in that sport. And then I remember after that trip, we came home, and a rider called Brock Rayford came over to Scotland, maybe the the following year, and he was teaching me switch whips. And switch whips is like a a trick which I'd always just wanted to do. Um. And I, I landed my first switch whip. And at that point, I was like, I'm done. Like, I got to the point which I wanted to be at. And I'm like, okay, that that's me. Like, And then from there on, my motivation to ride BMX just completely fell off. No way, right. And I'm like this with so much stuff. Um, Downhill, for me, I think now looking back at everything that I've done in my life, I have this kind of intrinsic motivation to get to a point where I'm pretty good and I got to that point in downhill and I think that's why I stopped racing I don't think it was because of the so many injuries I got to the point where I'd been shown that was what was possible so in my immediate circle when I started racing world cups Roy was there and Roy was probably the rider who was performing to the highest level in my immediate circle and Roy's an amazing rider and he's definitely had well he's world champion junior and stuff but when I got to the point that I did in downhill I was almost yes I was put off by so many injuries but I was also like right I've, I've got to that point that I've been shown what's possible Rory being like the top 20 top 15 rider at that time that's what I saw as as a viable option, that's what's possible for me. So at that point, I was like, okay, I've I've got to the point that's possible for me. Like I said, um, so I turned away, and then BMX, I got, I landed the switch whip. Right, that's what I'd like. That's the end of the journey for me. Um, and anything I do now is basically I just anything that I'm super passionate about, I get to this level of just like, yeah, I'm I'm satisfied with that. Whether it be mix it and DJ and or photography or some of the new things that I'm really passionate about are climbing, videography, um, running. These are things that I'm still getting to that point where I think is possible. Um, 
And with Enduro, the thing that's different is I've shown myself how far I can go. What with podiuming my first ever EWS, I was like, I've shown myself what's possible. Mm. So I'm not going to be satisfied until I do that again, I don't think, mm. if that makes sense. Yeah. Whereas with Downhill, my immediate circle was maybe like the top 20 rider. And I got to the top 20 rider. Like I had a 17th. And I won elite national, elite nationals, and I won junior national champs. Like I ticked these things off, which I knew somebody in my bracket was possible of, was capable of. Um, so I think the difference now for for enduro is like I've got so much intrinsic motivation to just to get to the point which I think is possible, and what's possible. I can I can be a podium rider if I if everything goes to plan. Like obviously EWS Tweed Valley the stars aligned and everything was completely in my favor but i don't see why with a lot of hard graft and getting my head down and i don't I'm, i want to be back there man which is it's mad but i'm motivated it's good was it almost like i feel kinda... like rambling there no but... that was sick <laughs> that was amazing that was really really cool um was it almost like you kind of accidentally rode yourself into shape via coaching is that mm. yeah okay so i've been coaching two and a half years now um and originally when i first got into coaching it was a completely selfless thing like my motivation was to get these young riders to become better on a bike right um, and i was speaking to andy who's been a massive part of your life massive part of my life massive part of reese's life and he's the co-owner of dirt school the company that i work for and i was speaking to him and I was like, when I first started coaching, it was a completely selfless thing. But at the same time now, it's almost a very selfish thing. Because when I'm coaching somebody how to ride a turn or whatever it might be, whatever like technical skill, I've got to have a complete understanding of that of that discipline or that goal. So by by me understanding everything that I explain on the hill... It's elevated my riding 10 times more. And that's insane for me. Like, I never really realized what coaching could do for me at the time. I took it all on board, but I don't think I really put into practice until the last two years what Andy and stuff taught me. I figured that that would be the case. Mm -hmm. um, like, almost that you've done this thing because you're like, I've got the knowledge, mm -hmm. I can give this to people. Mm -hmm. But then you're, you end up practicing fundamentals every single day. Mm -hmm. And nobody, like even your top level athletes are not practicing fundamentals anymore. Like, like I remember Reese when he first started, we'd just cut you down the street for hours. Mm -hmm. We'd do sprints, that sort of thing. You go into dirt school and you're forced to just ride around some cones. Mm -hmm. You really start to understand exactly what's going on. Yeah, you do. <laughs> and you you understand and you can see stuff that I never thought I'd be able to see. Um, whether it be like a technical skill or... We were having a good conversation on bass the other day about... Well, basically, I, I, it was a bit of a trick question. I asked the riders, for riders your level, what do you think makes the biggest difference to your performance? And to be fair, they gave me some really, really, really sick answers. They were like, oh, attention to detail, patience, breaking zones, line choice, um, sticking to a program, gym work. And I was like, yeah, 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 yeah. These are all mint answers. But what comes before that? You've got to be a happy person. You've got to be a happy athlete. An unhappy athlete is an athlete that's not going to be fast. They're not going to be able to perform. Um so before you start going to the gym five days a week to get big and strong if you're unhappy there's no point so something that i've been working on a lot personally is what i said to them was identify to begin with three things in your daily life that make you personally just happy so examples for me were a good routine eating healthily and speaking to my friends daily 
if you can add these three things to begin with to like a running checklist, a running set of processes in your day, and you start ticking these off and it becomes a habit, then all this purposeful practice that you do, whether it be technical skills, uplifting, going to the gym, then that's when that can make the difference. And they just stood there like that. And they were like, yeah, fair enough, I get that. So I like conversations like that are conversations that I remember massively when Ruri was coaching me. Just random tidbits that actually make a difference. And I hope, I hope to God that some of the things I've said over the last two years with with the group of riders that we've got now have sunk in. Maybe they don't put it into practice, but in three, four, five years' time when they're my age or whatever, they'll be like, damn, I remember what Innes said about just being happy. And then they start ticking their boxes and everyone's happy. That's so. amazing. Like, <laughs> people are so competitive in that environment that it yeah. almost is not... It can be completely unproductive. Yeah. Because nobody's enjoying themselves. Um, what do you think, just staying on that with like coaching this group of people, Like, what do you think it is... If you're just looking at, we're just looking at results, so speed, Mm -hmm. what is it that separates psychologically riders between the ones that are just able to have that switch, as you would call it, Mm -hmm. to just go at that, that speed from more of a mental point of view? Uh, Yeah, well, Reese said it himself, like, that's something I can't teach somebody. And Roy said that to, to Reese back when he first stepped on the mountain bike. Isn't, I've said that to one person over the last three years of coaching. And he, I was like, you've got it. And you know what it is, but I can't explain it and I can't teach it to you. Um, Who was the writer? Jason Purvis. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Dude was 15 when I said it and he was ripping and he's so fast. Um, and he's just got that like finesse that nobody's taught him. He's obviously just watched a lot of videos, picked up things that he thinks is cool, and he just has that, like, pizzazz. Um, And he's got a lot of areas in his life that he can develop on and grow on and build upon and and get better. He's young, he's just turned 16, but when he steps on a bike, everybody looks and like, holy shit, I'm the same. I'm like, I don't think I could ride that corner faster than you. And having conversations with, like, having conversations like that with riders like Jason hopefully that's something that he remembers and gives him so much confidence because I'd like to think that he looks up to me as a writer. Um, so that that's sort of like that selfless but also really selfish thing because that makes me feel so sick. Um, but I, I, <laughs> it's just this like self-motivation to just go fast. Whether it's, be, whether it's a competitive thing or not, for me it was never a competitive thing. Um, Whereas, for for example, Reese coming from a motocross background, he was bar to bar with riders. So he was like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut you up and I'm going to beat you. And I think that's why Reese and I, when we were on base together, didn't really see eye to eye, to be honest. Because I wasn't bothered about Reese. I didn't feel like I didn't want to beat Reese. I just wanted to be as fast as I could be. Um. And now looking back and understanding how flippin' hyper competitive Reese is, I'm like, alright, it makes sense. And I'm so stoked that Reese has gone on to to be as good as he is and, and win the stripes and win World Cups, man. Like when he first got that fourth place at Fort William. Yeah. When was that? Twenty twenty eighteen. Twenty eighteen. Oh, that that hurt. Because Reese and I were so competitive with each other at college, like he said. And I'd obviously stepped back from racing. And then to see Reese get that result, I was like, fuck, that could be me. And I was stoked for him, don't get me wrong. And I'm still am so stoked for him. But to see riders like Reese, who I was beating day in, day out at, at base, I'm sure he wouldn't mind me saying that. And then to see him like just keep ticking those boxes, get to the point, I'm like, oh, I should never have given that up. And the same for like uh, Loris Vergier and Lucas Shaw and stuff. Going into my second year of junior racing World Cups, 
me and Lars were one and two. I was ranked second in the world going into my second year, mm. year of junior, which was insane. Like I'd never even thought of that to be a possibility. And then I had a really bad crash that weekend in South Africa. What's that? Yeah, Peter Maritzburg and I ended up shattering my heel bone and that shattered my vip and it broke my heart again. Like, just like, fuck. I felt like that was genuinely just going to be such a good year. And then from there on, it just kind of like lost momentum and it went downhill. Excuse the pun. But now looking back, like I'm still stoked with, with how my life's turned out and it's shaped the person I am and I don't want to change anything, but... Yeah, hindsight is a mad thing, isn't it? It is. I think the reason why you're you said there you were like, um, oh, like a, you in twenty eighteen you were like, oh, I shouldn't have gave it up. Mm. But you're a hyper creative person, so you explained before that your attention is fleeting. Yeah. So you're just a fundamentally different person to like a Reese Wilson. True. Reese with that hyper competitive, um, almost like constant comparison towards your opponent as mm-hmm. he would see it mm-hmm. is what's taken him that totally. much further mm-hmm. whereas you're as a creative mind like I've, i have the same issue it's your attention's kind of fleeting like i'm always switching uh <laughs> whatever i'm doing right at the point <laughs> yeah. where i've gotten half decent at it like yeah that's me as well man it's just like i've be, got half decent at mountain bikes and it almost got to the point where it was just like a little bit boring so now i'm riding motocross i'll yeah. do that for a minute Mm-hmm. And then I'll be back on the mountain bikes and I'll be all over climbing for a while. Like I was, I was climbing for months without riding any bicycles. Like my attention is fleeing. That's just the creative Yeah, mind. we're very similar in that way. Yeah. But the thing is that you've got dialed that I've maybe not so much got dialed is what you said before. You like a routine. Mm-hmm. So, so how have you, how have you managed to sort of like with your mind and stuff, like implement a decent routine and, a, and an amount of discipline that's, allowed you to actually achieve those goals <sighs> trial and error i guess over the last couple of years since joining dirt school it's such a healthy environment and i've got such amazing people and such motivated people that i can have a conversation about anything with with andy and me and andy sit back to back in the office almost every afternoon after after coaching and i just turn around and be like andy what do you think about this and we'll just like completely dissect it for like half an hour and be like cool and then we'll turn around and go back to our work and working has been amazing for me whether it be working at the the restaurant back when I finished downhill like that was a routine maybe a pretty unhealthy routine but like I said everything that you do shapes you in a different way so so now my I've identified that routine is super important with to to me um having a a fairly early bedtime which is something i've never had before um eating healthier than i ever have checking them with your mates i think like lockdown and stuff like was really good for me like it's just taught me to like look out for folk i guess and that makes me happy and if you're happy you're you're happy right um i don't know what it's just trial and error uh routine is just something that makes me tick and keeps me on track i think when my routine goes out the door a lot of other things go out the door um but i'm something i'd encourage anybody to to try and do is find a routine that motivates you and keeps you happy and my routine is not going to be something that works for you my routine is going to be totally different to your routine but i don't know i'm not a psychologist but it's good for me no, it's it's really cool because that environment that you found yourself in is conducive to progress by just being there. Mm-hmm. So you've really found yourself in a in a in a great spot yeah, to for sure. continuously do something over time. Whereas for me, at least, like I struggle with routine and habits. Mm-hmm. My, my, I want st- I want stimulus like I need new you've got a very like novelty back and forth irregular job though <laughs> yeah it's a bit all over the place yeah um I love it and I when, love I, when I was being it. creative with video and photo and stuff I was convinced that I'm most productive at 3 a.m mm-hmm. 
So I get that stuck in my head and I find myself editing photos at 3.30 in the morning. I'm like, oh, I've got to get to work in six hours. Which now is just like, well, I taught myself a lesson. You can't, you can't work a very physical job and be editing at 3.30 a.m. So you've got to pick a priority. What's your prioritizing for me? It was earning an income, work. And then, so I stopped editing photos at 3 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> it's been the best thing I've ever done. <laughs> but sick. it's not going to work for some people. Some people, like, if you have a 12-hour deadline of editing something hectic, you've got to stay up. So it's probably quite difficult for you to have a routine. There's something about the sprint that I like in mm. a weird way. Like, it's it's painful and you're not getting any sleep. And But there's something about, like, right we have to do this by this time and you're just on like this mission it's kind of like yeah purpose, and you're motivated right you know and if you know it's it's for something that's bigger than you then mm -hmm. it, it's 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 cool but then obviously it's not sustainable as you say but um yeah i find myself like going in and out of habits like taking some on board and then just sort of going out like tossing others away for novelty more novelty mm -hmm. which is a, a kind of weird way that my brain works but it's, <laughs> it's quite good for making videos because <laughs> they're normally quite novel creative people are so whack <laughs> <laughs> it's so sick i love it it's so crazy all over the place uh -huh. um but yeah i'd love to come on a, on a base like i miss that i miss that constant routine as we've been saying mm -hmm. it's that that day-to-day -day and Andy Barlow, man, he's just such like a guardian. <laughs> and I've, I think I've said it to Andy before. Already. Andy's probably been the most influential male in my life. Mm. Just, just the way he is, he's so positive. And I think we've had a very similar past um, from being so competitive at racing, from being, yeah, just, I don't know. I'm very, very proud to, to call Andy a friend and be able to work with him and be constantly learning from him and also now giving him feedback on his riding. We went riding the other day and I was like, Andy, you're, you're doing that thing again. He was like, what do you mean? I filmed him. And it's like that feedback loop that, that base has this. You, you, you can't get that anywhere else, I don't think. Like constant feedback from, from visual, from just spoken word, like, I have 40 students that I see three days, four days a week. And I try and strike a personal relationship with every, every one of them. Like I want to have them as a friend and also students. And because I think when you have that just like comfortable relationship with somebody, you can then learn the most from them. Mm. And I can learn how they learn, which is half the battle with coaching. You need to understand how different people take feedback. Some people need to say a video of them doing something badly where some people need to see you do it for example like um explain demonstrate imitate oh, feedback really? loop i was talking about yeah i mean if there were one piece of advice that i was able to give to the mountain biking community is film yourself mm. you need to see by the way shout out to castro yeah. i love those videos i've bike. stolen so many of his <laughs> teaching points but he's such a nerd it, it ends up in such ridiculous detail it's it's amazing mm. it's, he's uh, a creative boy yeah he is a, he is a creative boy <clears throat> that um that first season was was great because we had the the time to like really flesh out each of the concepts and the ideas and then i would sit for a week and make the graphics and stuff like that for it as well and that's what really elevated it this second series we had to get it done by the end of the year. It was a lot busier because of running the team. Mm -hmm. We had to be quicker. I can't it. believe how you've managed to juggle both. To see the newest two videos of something you put out in the last week, it's like, when have you done that? All just before the new year, like right. squeezing it all in right before the new year. Okay. So, Cartho, you could film like one day a week with Cartho now because he's, he's got a family and everything like mm -hmm. that. Like he's got a huge amount to do and he's got this whole team to to run so he's a, he's a difficult man to to get a hold of now so i think everyone will agree that those videos strike a really good balance of professional and real 
like seeing Cathro speaking to the camera about, yeah, I'm sick as a dog right now because my kid gave me the flu. It's just like, yeah, that's life. And you don't see that anywhere else. That's that's kind of a little bit of a vibe that I want to bring to to whatever I put out on YouTube. I think overall we could all do a better job at being more honest in this sport. 100%. It's, uh, in life, man. Yeah. Social media is covered in just fake bullshit. I'm sick of it. It's transparency that makes it, and people don't, when they're putting something out there, you know, certain uh, people that film stuff, like they're looking at it from like a clinical standpoint. They're trying to just make it look as good as possible. But then where's the where's the story? You know, we have to see what the struggle actually was in order to understand the full context of the situation. Mm-hmm. And the emotion, I've said it already before, but like in extreme sports, like there's just this thing where everyone's hiding and everyone's like got everyone's got their helmets on and no one's given their emotions away because, you know, either that might give it away to an opponent mm. or it's just like an ego thing. Like I'm an I'm Superman type of thing. So it's almost bringing that series. I see the Pink Bike Racing series mm-hmm. and shout out to Harry Jenkinson, who we mm-hmm. employed um, to to take this on. He's been the director of it i've edited a couple but he's edited most of them okay um he's just done a fantastic job of telling the honest truth from almost we say it as well from it's like a feminine perspective like (laughs) extreme sports is overly masculine like in in general like it's just it's hard men going down the hill and Mm. i think we've shown as well like the female side of the sport through having Amy Kenyon on the team. Yeah. The the issue with with it is coverage. It's storytelling. Mm-hmm. Because when you tell those stories, I think everyone can agree People that Amy's, get invested, right? Amy's story from this year was amazing. Yeah. So when you take the time to pay attention, actually see what's going on, actually listen to what the athletes are thinking, and then honestly portray that. It's a seriously compelling story, especially for the girls, because it's it's all it's harder. You know, that jump that, that all the yeah. guys are struggling to get over, <clears> they <throat> need to do that too. They need to think about that. Amy had never done done any jumps mm-hmm. like that, you know, then you've got this road gap at Leo Gang, which is like a death trap. I think look gnarly. So yeah, I think we could all do a better job of being more honest in the in the sport in general. Preach. I'm I'm trying my best. I, I don't want to be any like fake. I just want to be me. And I guess that's my goal with YouTube is like, if you like what you see, follow it. If you don't like it, don't follow it. And like, if you don't have anything positive to say, just don't say anything. Is a, a bit of a motto that my mum taught me. And I'm getting better at it. I would also say like, if you can afford to, if you find yourself in a position where you're, you're pretty well supported, Mm-hmm. get a videographer because like just to have somebody that's thinking about even filming it and putting it together somebody that you can collaborate with like if that's possible to do i think you should do that at the first possible for and en- for anybody in sport what do you mean i think in for anybody in sport yeah i think if you're an athlete currently if mm-hmm. you're not being documented you're basically almost invisible unless you're winning the all of the races true and that yeah. is the you could say it's a sad reality, but it's just kind of the reality of the situation is like you yeah. have to film. Life almost revolves around the cameras, especially for people like me. So it's like... Yeah, true. You... Yeah, I it's... Think it's difficult, eh? Because to strike a balance of not going on your phone, mm. because it's such an unhealthy habit that so many of us have. Like you look at your screen time sometime, you're like, six hours? Yeah. What? Maybe more. A working day, just like scrolling Instagram. If, if I, oh, you'll look at a laptop probably seven hours of the day if you're There's editing a more. Distinct difference, but to I separate creating and consuming. Yeah. Very, very distinctly. Uh-huh. So when I get up in the morning, in order to do the best day's work that I could possibly do, on like a let's say a sprint day where it's like I need to edit this thing and I need to do it top notch. Mm. I'll get up and I'll I'll not check my phone. There's your routine, bro. And then you go in and you're in that mode of creating. As soon as you switch out of that and as soon as you watch something on mm. YouTube, like a 10-minute video, mm-hmm. you're out of that creative. You're now responding. Yeah. 
So for people that are struggling with that, don't check your phone if you're trying to create something. Like you just need to absolutely cut that out. I've, I'll, well, obviously I'm very into to drum and bass music and, and production and stuff. I've not done any production, but I listen to a lot of podcasts about production. And a common question that, that podcast hosts ask producers is like, have you ever been in a, a what do you call it, a creative block or writer's block or something in there? And some of them say yes and some of them say no. And the answers of like how to get out of that is stop listening. Well, for them, it's stop listening to music. When you start listening mm. to other music, especially in your genre, you get this kind of like tunnel vision of like, right, I need to create in this way. And it's probably a similar thing with you. Like if you're consuming a lot of media, you kind of, I bet that your creative process goes in that direction. Mm. But when you're creating media that's the same as everything else, it's the same as everything else. Like I guess the goal is to be unique, right? And create something different. That's how you're going to stand out. Unless you make a stupid crash reel on Instagram. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, yeah, like I, I don't watch a lot of mountain bike videos. Okay. Um, there you go. That's cool. I appreciate that. And but like, there's also for me, there's also like, there's almost unconscious consuming. So there's stuff like that'll get suggested on YouTube that I just gonna put on in the background. That's unconscious consuming. Mm -hmm. And then there's like, I'm gonna sit down and watch the sailing documentary. <laughs> And there's a sailing documentary on Netflix. Oh, what was it called? It was like Unknown or something like that. It okay. was a series, mm -hmm. but the sailing one, phenomenal. Yeah, so I like imagine. I just, I come away from watching something like that and my brain's like tweaking. Yeah, I'm like yeah, yeah. firing on all cylinders. I'm Let's like, go. shit, I need to make something, you yeah. know? So I'm glad to have that kind of natural urge um, yeah. to, to, to make something. And that's clearly what you've got as well. Because... Mm -hmm in your spare time like you're not doing you're not mixing or doing any of that for like any sort of money or anything no it's just pure like just i got to be making progress with something yeah and until i get to the point where i'm i'm satisfied with it i'm never gonna stop and it's sick have I've you got ever... to always have something on the side which is a blessing in disguise or cur a blessing bless or a curse yeah because man i have no free time <laughs> <laughs> But it's, it's the way I choose to live my life. It's meant. Have you ever thought about pursuing the D, the DJ and then the mixing and everything like that as like a like an actual thing? I guess subconsciously, yes. When so Cal McGee, who was mentioned in Reese's podcast, we'll bring him up every podcast <laughs> just to make it a thing. Cal McGee, <laughs> uh, top don. He introduced me to mixing in lockdown, and when he moved to Colorado, I was like, shit, he's took his decks with him. So I ended up buying buying decks, and I just sold. I think I just sold my radon, in fact, to to Peach, Peach, not Peach, to uh, Paul Paul Mel. <laughs> no, Pooge. no, Blair's mate. Peach. I can't believe I can't remember his name. I'm so sorry. Peach. You did no. <laughs> you just said Peach, <laughs> not Peach. Paul Stop. Paul Mel used to be called Peach. No, not Paul. <laughs> it's Paul's mate. Blair's mate. Uh. You're going to have to cut this CP. up. CP. I sold my yeah, e-bike to CP. I was like, shit, I've got some money here. So I ended up buying the industry standard decks. Because I was like, if I'm going to learn how to mix, I might as well learn how to mix on something that I can go into a club and mix on. Don't know why. It was never my goal to become a club DJ. But I guess it's just my the way my brain works is like, got to get to that level that's that I'm satisfied with. And to answer your question, no, I'm not that motivated to make money by mixing, but I just enjoy it, and it's something that I can make progress with. It's something I'm learning, it's satisfying, and I like music. So the reason, like, I started recording mixes because I wanted to listen to all my favorite tunes back to back. That was the motivation, I guess. Sick. <laughs> um, it's actually, that was also really difficult to put out into the world of social media because I was like it doesn't really or my thought process was it doesn't really fit with professional sport mm. like rave culture and, and drum and bass music doesn't really go hand in hand with being an athlete not that I'm an, a professional athlete but it's definitely the the area that I work in if and you were looking at it from like a strict commercial 
brand yeah. perspective, I could see where you're coming from, like associating yourself with rave culture almost. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. But then I spoke to Miranda Miller about it because I was like, what do you think? And she was like, nah, it just makes you unique and individual. And I was like, ah, yeah, fair enough. And then I've not thought about that before I, or not thought about that again. But I think I'm just a bit mental <laughs> and I overthink so much stuff. Eh? I do it as well. Yeah. It's part of the reason why I'm doing this podcast is <laughs> to stop that, you know, like stop overthinking stuff and just. Or just make the overthinking into a conversation. Exactly, yeah. Which you can learn from, I can learn from. Hopefully the the viewers and listeners can just look at those like, you guys are mental. <laughs> <laughs> so what I got from this podcast is uh, they're both cooked. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Mm. Um, like with, you were talking about buying decks, and it <laughs> made me think, like, are you kind of like a, a techie type? Are you like a like a fitness watch are you a stats guy? You got the you got the Garmin on there. I am a stats guy. Um. Okay. Cool conversation. I was having this conversation today with a with one of our base students. Um. And it goes hand in hand with routine. Since. Since training, what well, I guess leading up to last year's EWS season, and then now I'm like balls deep in a training block. Having numbers and data on your wrist especially for rest and recovery has changed my life not that you you shouldn't live by what your watch says like the watch that i have oh, gives... i'm only 10 percent recovered today exactly. i'm not gonna be at my best <laughs> which i think if if i wake up at a race and my watch says you've slept poorly and you've got 50 percent body battery that's gonna fuck with my head but especially at this stage in my training, it's just another good metric to quantify how you feel. You should always go off RPE or like rate of perceived exertion. But to be able to compare your, for example, like the most simplest level, what's your resting heart rate? If my resting heart rate is 10 beats higher than normal, maybe I won't train today. And that's super value for valuable for, for me and any buddy whether you're a top level performer or somebody just getting into sport like if you want to be healthy just pay attention to, to your body like give yourself some good food rest especially the the sleep score stuff on on these watches that you can get access to these days has made it kind of a game and it's more motivation for me to go to bed at 8 30 9 o'clock every night which i do and that goes hand in hand with my routine I've never felt better. I've never had more energy since I've been getting more rest. And the catalyst for me to to make that healthy change in my life, to go to bed at a ridiculously early hour compared to what I used to, has been having this watch on my wrist. So if you're a numbers guy, get a watch and go to bed early. <laughs> this is mint. I feel like the numbers guys will already have a watch. True. But for people, for yeah, people, fair. Good point. For people like me, I always saw cycling and riding a bike as more of like a performance art mm -hmm. rather than like a like I would go racing but mm -hmm. ultimately I was into it for the way that it looked because the filming and the riding sort of went hand in hand so when I was riding I wouldn't really feel that fired up until we got a camera out and then I'm mm -hmm. like I'm in it I'm into it now because now I'll be able to see how I look I'll be able to do that so it was always an aesthetic motivation for me yeah cool so I never got into the watches or stuff but recently I've been like going running mm. and that sort of stuff. And I'm like, how far did I run? Like, I've got no idea. So I've been looking at all these blooming watches. <clears throat> what watch have you got? So funny story, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a story for everything. <laughs> uh, for the Christmas break, I went to Barcelona to visit my girlfriend. Um, and I had a Garmin Forerunner 735 XT, if you're a nerd. And I forgot my charger. I got to the Edinburgh airport. I was like, oh, Oh, I forgot my charger. Ah, prime opportunity to buy a new watch. <laughs> so I went into whatever tech shop. I was like, I'm looking to buy a Garmin watch. And they're like, okay, here we go. We've got this, 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 this. And then the the watch that I bought was a, a Garmin Fenix 6 Pro. And it was 50% off. I was like, done. And that's that was just before Christmas. And that's when I like upped my game with my sleep and stuff. And it genuinely is mental. If, if it... If that's what it takes for me to be motivated to go to bed early and 
implement some good positive changes in routine in my life, then happy days. It's annoying that it took me to spend a whole whack of money on a watch to get that, but we're here. They're spending for sure. I think for some yeah. people it'll help a lot and for others it won't. Mm-hmm. And I never, I couldn't decide what camp I'm, I can't decide what sure. camp I'm in. Uh-huh. Like I see the, like the Apple watch ultra and that kind of caught my attention, but I got real skinny wrists. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so yeah, it, me would, too. <laughs> it would look stupid. I think it would just look silly and well, man, you don't need to spend big money. You can, I remember when I was at college, Andy encouraged me to just track my heart rate. So I think I spent like 50 quid, which is a luxury to be able to spend 50 quid on a watch. But for me at the time, it was money well spent. And ever since then, I've been aware of heart rate and tracking data and stuff. Um, yeah. What do you think about that kind of like the, the duality of riding for, for like almost like riding for Strava and riding for like creativity? How much of your writing now is like just surely for like almost creativity's sake it breaks my heart but i don't really ride my bike for me anymore bmx was amazing for that because it was 100 percent for me and it's not that i don't like the way i live my life right now in fact it's the best i've ever lived my life I ride my bike a lot, like the volume of hours I spend on a bike is mad because I'm coaching so much. But then on the weekends when my friends are going riding, I'm training. And it's just it's just the way it is. I, I can't fit everything into my life. You've got to prioritize things. And for me, the priority right now is work and training. So I don't hate it. I'm pretty stoked, in fact, but I don't really ride for creativity there's always a goal and um, whenever i go out on my bike okay today i'm working on raw speed today i'm working on technique today i'm working on body position today i'm working on line choice or whatever it is i'm such a nerd i'll go into a rabbit hole of of technique and stuff but that's what motivates me i guess sick and <laughs> what what are the students like on there this by the way the base course is going to get an absolute influx of uh, <laughs> of applications after the last two races like True. you know oh I could all, ev- my entire success to dirt school and now you're coming on like you know? <laughs> everyone's gonna be like i'm going to dirt school <laughs> <laughs> you're right man i was i think if there's two things that you could spend money on as a as a young rider it'd be a good set of tires and, and some i like co- that and like some coaching i like it that's first the tires <laughs> Oh, it's because I was following some lad today and I was just thinking, man, you're not slowing down anywhere because <laughs> your tires are so bald. <laughs> I felt sorry for him. So it's t- you sort your tires. Sort your tires and get coached. Get some coaching. And when you're getting coached, pay attention. Really listen to what that person's saying, whoever it is. Um, mm, because I don't think I consciously listened and put it into practice when I was being coached personally. I took it on board, but I think if I'd actually practiced what I was being taught, I would have maybe been a little bit more successful in my career. Mm. I think yeah. Reese did a very good job of taking it on board and, and practicing that stuff. In fact, the first time I ever saw <laughs> Reese ride a mountain bike, he came into a rut, sat down, foot out like this, ah! <laughs> in, in a leaf and down a car park. I was like, who is that dude. <laughs> that was day one of bay so I was like okay this guy is interesting i'd never seen motocross before no way no before before base i didn't even know motocross was a sport mm. <laughs> so funny do you ever coach people that are just like it's just impossible what do you mean like as in they're just not listening or they're not they're not able to okay. uptake. So some people are coachable, some people I don't want to say are uncoachable because I guess I just haven't figured out the way of explaining something so that they take it on board. But that's my personal development. Um luckily I don't do much or well, not luckily, that makes it sound terrible, but <laughs> <laughs> I don't do much of our day course stuff. Um because my my job role is, I guess, lead base coach. 
So I write the plan and I communicate with the students and the staff what each session is about, which is amazing. This is what Ruri's job was when, when I was on base. And did Roy coach you when you were on base? Yeah. A little bit. Um, so I basically took took his role and it's amazing. But like I was saying earlier, I try and strike a relationship with, with each of our students to a good level. Um, and there's not really anybody that's that's uncoachable. I've definitely had to learn different ways of explaining things and making it make sense to them to make it relatable. But um, for sure, there's been points where I've been coaching on a weekend and I'm just like explaining something. This was, I guess, in my first year of coaching, so it was a lot less experience. But I was just sitting there feeling like I'm talking to a brick wall. And to be fair, it was n- no fault of the client, I don't think, because they've obviously come to us for the service and it's my bad for not being able to explain it. But I think now I've got a pretty good understanding of how different people receive information and how to make a difference to the writing. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's been a journey, man. It's been really interesting. To, and it's been more, like I said, like self-development than anything else to, to get to where we are. So when you're when you're explaining something to somebody, do you do you really like go into granular detail like do you do a cathro and start talking about you know that's not really my my style are you so are you more trying to interpret it in a nicely neatly packed set of words that'll make them do it so like if you say for example like oh you want it to feel like i don't know a wave or something like that you Mm -hmm. know are you using Mm -hmm. more sort of descriptive for the level of ride that I coach I definitely coach with a feeling because our base students have got themselves to a level where they're very competent riders so when I talk about how something should feel they're like yeah that makes sense 90% of the time if it doesn't make sense to them what I'm explaining then I'll normally film them and show them and try and explain that way Mm. and it's the it's the goal it's having the end goal that makes the difference it's like if we're trying to carry your speed then the techniques to allow us to do that are what's going to make the difference if that makes sense yeah um but you've do you find that there's these because we were talking about in how to bike as well like there's sure. like a huge gap between like what like what you feel and what's real that was a tiger woods quote originally i've um, never heard of that yeah so i mean w- with golf especially uh-huh. it's such a small movement mm-hmm. that there's just you, there's not much feedback that you're getting from that so the the how it feels and the reality of the situation are sometimes just miles apart like mm-hmm. you think you think it was a certain way and it's it just weren't sure um do you find that people are just wildly off well i guess yeah <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> like you oh man you'll be stood at glendress and you'll watch people come through and they'll be doing like turn bars and stuff and they won't be bad riders and stuff but i bet they feel like they're scrubbing the hell out of the tabletops at glad trash free ride zone and we've all been there man like you send a whip when you're 10 years old and you're like oh it's sick and you look back oh let's not show anybody that yeah yeah <laughs> which is funny man. that's me at the moment in motocross <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly what it is i feel like jeffrey harlan's every roast corner. the turn <laughs> and then you look at it and you're like uh, oh, I'm bought up right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I was gonna like, what kind of involvement have you had with Stan Nisbet? Oh wow, hot topic. So yeah, Stan Nisbet is a 13 year old kid who's faster than me. <laughs> In a nutshell, he's been getting coached by dirt school since he was six years old um, and his style is immaculate he's years above his age and his skill level it is his finesse i guess he's he's pretty shy um but his temperament's so chilled out i don't want to big him up too much because he's only a kid right but i remember coaching stan on our advanced academy which is like the the highest level of our kids kids courses that we we offer at dirt school and he will spot lines that i hadn't even noticed 
and he was like, oh, Ennis, what do you think about linking this grip point here and then getting high and then duck, ducking in between that, that root and that tree? I'm like, yeah, do it. And he'll do it first try. I'm like, that was sick. I don't know what it is that's got him to that level. I think he's had amazing support from his family. He obviously lives in the Tweed Valley. He's been getting coached by amazing coaches since the age of six and he's just been around great opportunity um amazing encouragement and his dad's just so behind him I guess it's like something that I was taught when I was at college was there's no such thing as talent it's hard work opportunity and and what was it something else have you ever heard that there's no such thing as talent it's hard work opportunity and it's, I thought it was just when hard work meets opportunity yeah, there you go. That's Stan in a nutshell. He's he's cool, calm, and collected, I guess, and I wish him all the best. Uh, yeah, I don't want to say too much about it because you don't want to jinx it. But yeah, I know, you know I mean? it's it's exciting though. I had a conversation with Stan actually in the gym because he's he's starting to train a little bit. Um, and I was like, well, he was talking about opportunities, right, in in the sport. And he's been offered this this deal with a with a team, and I'm like, okay, so yes, amazing. By all means, that's incredible to be even offered a deal on a on a team like that at that age. But you're only twelve, dude. Just take it easy. And he, and he, we were we were talking like me and you are talking like adults, right? And he was like, yeah, but I think look at Goldstone the way the sport's going if you're not getting that factory support from my age how do you keep up because mm. guaranteed someone else is going to be getting that support and i was like you've thought about this man and i just think oh, yeah he'll he'll learn and he'll he'll do whatever he thinks best and i think that's some really good advice is just go with your gut feeling if you've got an opportunity something i'd say to myself if i was 16 is if you've got an opportunity especially in this sport take it um so yeah hot, cool cool topic actually i'm yeah. still you asked me about stan because i've got a lot of time for him it is he's interesting flipping huge now as well yeah he's, he's, a big, he's a big lad like i keep seeing videos <clears throat> mm. i was not looking like that when i was 13 i was <laughs> no. a scrawny little lad yeah but I mean, still scrawny <laughs> <laughs> um the the moto side of things is it's been like that for a while where great example yeah you're you've, you're having kids with passionate uh parents that are raising their kids from putting them on a bike at like four years old mm. and just not stopping and like taking them out of school all that sort of stuff to in order to get to that level and it, it'll get like that again you brought up goldstone and that's a perfect example of of that happening just i that. think it will make it or break it for some people and it obviously has in motocross um yeah yeah because people fall out of love with it if it's if it becomes too serious too quick where's That's the, the danger that was my first concern when stan spoke to me about his his thoughts and his opportunities and stuff i was like dude you're just 12 man i can't imagine thinking about that level of it's like go play chasing go, go play tag in the park what was i doing like, once i was 12 yeah. like climbing trees bro <laughs> <laughs> whacking nettles with sticks <laughs> <laughs> and you're thinking about man should i sign for this team i'm like fuck that's exciting. It's sick. Yeah. I just, it's sick that, that companies now recognize young riders to be... I just hope that companies don't take the piss out of these young riders, whether it be Stan or anybody else. Like, you've got to respect them as, as people. And, like, they obviously love this sport. Don't make them not love this sport, mm. which could happen so easily. Absolutely. Damn. Heavy. <laughs> yeah, no, it was funny because in that last podcast for Reese. He said something along the lines of, um, but at the time I didn't deserve any money. Yeah. On multiple, he said it like twice. He was like, he was getting rides, mm -hmm. but at the time, and he said it, I didn't deserve any money. So what does, it, what does that tell you about the pr perspective of the, he's like, just seen the lay of the land and he's seen that people aren't getting paid at his level. So that's just accepted as reality. <clears throat> 
but like I don't know what do you think about that like the state of the sport in that regard I think riders are definitely underpaid if you compare them to other sports but then other sports have way more exposure than us so it's striking a balance of like I'm dedicating my whole life and I listened to a podcast actually and it was a road cyclist talking about how much time he dedicated to training that the the host of the podcast said or asked how many hours do you train and the the guest said 24 7 everything I do in my life goes towards my one goal of getting faster on a bike and I think that's the level that a lot of mountain bikers have dedicated to the sport like Reese I'm sure is probably the same like 24 7 everything I do is a calculated decision to make me faster on a bike and I don't think many people in their whole life think like that so if you talk about like dedication and, and value of somebody's time then yeah we're highly underpaid but then again like from a corporate perspective which i don't really have an understanding of you're not selling bikes to the point where people are selling flipping what's something that sells like footballs or something man like football shirts and that's why footballers are paid so much money because they're on telly and they're used as adverts and there's perfume adverts with dudes in boxer shorts gambling adverts and yeah that stuff like that which we were just we're just not in that that market but it's a brutal one because young people are trying to make a breakthrough season in their first year elite or something and then they nail themselves like, ah, i can't do this anymore because i'm not making any money so something like i think there's so many riders in this world which just don't have the opportunity to race a world cup I think there's probably riders that are just as fast as the top 10, but they live in a place where they don't have access to to a phone or a bike or whatever to to expose themselves to get that support or that opportunity. But I don't know, especially in BMX, actually. Mm. There's dudes who are so, so good, like doing the stuff that's never been done on their bikes and just posting on Instagram and it gets like... 10 views or something it's It's gnarly man so many of those in bmx Mm. i also think just sleepers bro sleepers yeah (laughs) true the athletes are i think kind of by nature easy to manipulate easy to easy to get excited because they're kind of living their dream you know they're they're doing their passion Mm -hmm. so a lot of these bigger companies are completely taking the piss like they could they could <laughs> they could take pay them more but they're they're gonna get away with not paying them enough because they're just a very agreeable nice athlete mm-hmm. you know and those people get walked all over you have mm. to at some point ask yourself what am i worth and what will i settle for and fight for that you really do have to fight tooth and nail for that mm-hmm and that brings us back to vlogging. If you can take some of That's that... That's exactly what I was thinking. The, if you can take some of that power into your own hands, mm-hmm. take it out of theirs. <clears throat> yeah, think of yourself as a brand. Like, you're not just a writer. You're, you're your own entity. You're your own brand. If you can add value to that brand, then it gives you bargaining rights when you're trying to sign a contract. They're like, well, I'm already getting half a million views or whatever. It's probably quite extreme, but <laughs> in mountain biking, yeah. sometimes if yeah. if you get one video that blows up, which easily can happen, there's so much more exposure to the brand, so you're more valuable. Yeah, we're trading in we're trading in eyeballs. It's brutal, it's man. It's attention. It's all about attention. Yeah, it's madness. And it's it's some people just can't. They don't have the capacity to focus on both. They can't be train. They can't train. And do everything that they need to do in order to get there, mm. and also be recording themselves, like presenting themselves. Some people, as we've discussed, a lot of mountain bikers are trying to get out into nature. They're trying to get away <laughs> from people, at like inherently trying to get away. And so you put them in a situation where they have to present themselves to the world. Mm-hmm. It's like a lot of people are not going to feel like they're compatible for that. But I think people would surprise themselves. A lot of people would surprise themselves. They're quite 
like people are more interesting than like you're more interesting than you think almost Mm -hmm. like as an athlete you're you are inherently interesting you're doing quite like a very rare yeah thing you've got very rare opportunities and people would like to vicariously live through you what I had to say to myself and I was like, oh, should I start a YouTube? Blah, blah, blah. It's like, think about the media that you consume. Like I'll go back to what I said earlier. It's like, I'm just want to put out stuff that I would be stoked to see, whether it be music mixes, race vlogs, POV stuff from sick venues that I go to this year, or maybe I'll film what it's like to be on a base day. Mm, that would be interesting. That would be really interesting. Yeah. And as a young rider, looking to join base maybe that would be the deciding fact yeah that's amazing or yeah it's not for me so it all contributes my work my brand blah 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 but then again if you don't feel comfortable and ready to put yourself out there you don't there's there's no there's no point it's got to be ready and it's got to be a good time and it's also like are you like for a lot of people out there it's like are you pursuing pursuing it professionally because that's a decision that you only you're only going to come across that roadblock mm-hmm. if you're trying to make you know riding your bike into a job mm-hmm. i would argue that you have to be doing something along those lines but for your average person it should most people should just be focusing on enjoying the ride as much as possible when they're out they shouldn't be yeah. thinking like you know how am i going to get sponsored by this chain lube company or what whatever mm-hmm. you know they shouldn't be out there trying to trying to do all that because it, it does it, for for me for a bit like when i was riding for radon which was amazing because like for them to support somebody of my level like i'm not in, i'm not incredibly good and pretty in the middle um i can do the odd thing you can back foot bro pick yourself up <laughs> could you back foot right now <laughs> do, if I, if do I took, a back flip <laughs> <laughs> if i took you to a dirt jump could you bust a flip if it's a step up yeah sick <laughs> um no but like at at my level do you know you know what i mean like i wasn't like i'm not like extra extra like good or anything so for them to give me a ride i was like super buzzing for it and they like a like a a small wage it's like whoa like i'm a professional mountain biker and that that was incredible um but it got to the point where i would go out and if i didn't get a clip Hmm. like if i didn't get a good clip i was like oh fuck so the whole ride was revolving around just getting a clip clip culture and, and that yeah it did it did kind of make it different it just it, it changed it like we were we were going out and instead of just jibbing for the sake of the love of jibbing i was trying to get this clip because i felt like i was given this thing that i almost didn't deserve mm. so i was like trying to prove to myself that i did deserve it so i would go out every time and that was like a a bit of a thing and then as soon as the kind of the raid on thing slowly came to a close and then I just started going out riding mm. and not filming at all. It was so liberating. It was just like... Honestly, I don't think I've ever not filmed or been motivated to get clips. Mm. Ever. Like, I've got videos on Facebook of me self-filming stuff from when I was 11 years old. I think my, my goal was always, for some reason, film stuff and be creative. Mm-hmm. yeah um, i i love it but yeah. it, it's that self-critical thing we were talking about before mm-hmm. like if you believe that you should be here each time you're going out on a ride and you're trying you're, you're never quite getting yeah. there like that does kind of like wear you out when there's a responsibility behind it mm-hmm. i would totally think about it differently now and i would just yeah. be having a good time but at the time that's kind of the motion that i went through i think in bmx it's pretty toxic in that sense like mm. you're always comparing yourself to the, the to the next dude or like for me riding BMX was just like oh I just want to progress it was never to like be better than somebody or whatever but I know a lot of friends who've have struggled with that and like they've always comparing themselves to to this guy or look check this out how the hell did he do that I was like dude just don't stress about it man you, it's so cliche to say just enjoy riding your bike. Don't worry about anything else. It's when you're enjoying riding your bike that the sponsors will come. It's like every mountain bike podcast that like, oh, if there's any advice to, to young kids, just enjoy it. Which is so easy to say, but like kids want to get sponsored. Yeah. Why? Yeah. Why? 
why do you want sponsored? Because ultimately, it all kind of begins from like an a, an ego perspective. Mm. I'm sponsored. Mm. Oh, you know. And I, I was I tried to do like everybody that I met. They were like, wait, you're sponsored. <laughs> And I'd be like, yeah, but fucking hell, like, it's not what matters. And I try and go off on a <laughs> yeah. spiel about how it's like, it's not like, not something that you should even really be thinking about at all. Like, if you're in a position where you're, you've enjoyed yourself that much, mm. that you've gotten that good, that companies are interested in, as we said in the how to bike thing, like putting their logo on your billboard. Mm. Sweet, get sponsored. Yeah, it's but it's also like, don't just take stuff that you don't even like the product as well. People just getting twenty percent off, and then they're like putting up like a list of ten sponsors in their bio on Instagram, and they're, they've only yeah. got twenty percent off for all ten. Yeah, I think that's something I'm very proud to have achieved. Is like I've never been supported or by anybody that I really don't believe in. Like I've loved the the people or the company or the product, and I've been proud to represent them. I think that's something that's probably really worth to take on board and remember especially if you're a young young rider trying to make a name in this sport don't like just don't take a sponsor because it's a sponsor like you think of yourself and don't i want to say like devalue yourself by saying like yes to this clothing brand like fair play to the clothing brand for starting and i've got respect for people who who have a hustle like that, but I don't want to name names, but I had a conversation with somebody recently about like they had a, an offer for a factory team and they were already writing for another brand. And I was like, think about what this brand is seen as, like how well respected this brand is seen as and you riding for them and then changing teams, although it's like a factory team, <laughs> are you going down? Mm. like yes they're offering you a little bit of money but don't jump on that as a first chance like you almost devalue yourself and then it's going to be hard to get back up to here there's a lot of i don't know i hope i didn't say too much then. no no they, <laughs> but it's no like specifics. you got to be aware of what you're worth i think it goes back to that money conversation um but just ride your bike for fun. Don't just be worried about it. Rip about... a couple of turns, learn to backflip, <laughs> buy a camera. <laughs> That's infinite fun. <laughs> and then when you go to the skate park and someone says, can you backflip? And you're like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when was the last backflip you've done? Uh, my... The one with Ryan? It wasn't Ryan that... filmed was it. Was it that one? <laughs> yeah, I've not flipped in. That's amazing. Insert clip here. <laughs> on my head. I can't believe it did that. It was, it was amazing. like second day on a or third day on a flipping mountain bike. Second time ever riding a twenty nine. Can you backflip? No, but I'll try one. <laughs> Good splat. Yeah, what if you've not seen that? The racing killed the love video. It's got that in. It's a great clip. Um, I was gonna bring up as well. Whilst we're on just people that you've been involved with, uh, William Brody. Oi, oi. That edit that you did with him was sick. Did you like it? I like that. Thanks, dude. I liked that a lot. Appreciate you. Yeah, I rate that. There was um. Was he's it? just got a, he's got a steez about him. It's like there's almost a motor. Well, has he rode motocross before? I have no idea. He's got he real can like scrub the hell out of anything. Yeah, big scrubs and and a lot of like elbow posture. Mm -hmm. He's got that raw speed sort of just like you can't teach that thing again. Actually, now I come to think of it. William's a sick rider. He's really small, super strong. Man can ride a bike. And he's actually getting some a bit of consistency now. When he was on base and I was coaching him, he would just crash his brains out and go way too fast, much like myself. But I think he's sort of maybe figured it out. And he went and did like some fastest times of the day on some Scottish Enduro races and stuff. Why did you make that video? Okay, so when I had a little bit of free time, I had the idea of documenting some local riders in the Scottish borders just to give them some more exposure. Sleepers. 
Yeah, kind of. Would you like a job? Kind of inspired by yourself, <laughs> to be honest. How much are you going to pay me? <laughs> um, and the idea was to call it This Is Scotland or something along those lines. SCO, I think I was going to call it. Um, and I, I actually filmed William, Corey Watson. I've got Corey Watson's footage and Jake Ebden. Jake Ebden's video is sitting on YouTube right now ready to be unli- or made listed sick um and then i wanted to make it almost like a short feature length film it was kind of a personal project and i just ran out of time i did one day with phoebe gale these are sick. all writers that you probably should get on this podcast yeah They're absolutely super local to you and the amount of talent in this area is insane yeah and i don't think a lot of them have really cottoned on to the idea of social media and putting yourself out there mm. And I just felt like it was my obligation to do that. Sick, um, man. So, so, yeah, William was the first person that I managed to finish and edit and get out there. And I'm really proud of that video. And I think all the bass students have been always go on about it. Oh, that video of William was sick, man. I was like, if I can get kids inspired to ride bikes, especially in this area, happy days, my job's done. And it's still such a big motivation for me. Um, yeah. Sadly, I have no free time and I've got loads of sick footage of, of Corey Watson just sitting there on a hard drive needing to have something done with it. No, that, that video slaps. Like it's mm. you've got you've got an eye for it for sure. It's it's quite impressive. I remember you, you did like a little kind of documentary back in the day with uh, Louis Buchanan back in yeah. the day. You made Holy a little moly. like a, a little piece with him and it was just like Fucking hell, Ennis is really multifaceted, isn't he? He's just like I'm just obsessed with learning new skills, eh? I love when it when you <laughs> I love it when you phone me with just some obscure Premiere Pro problem. <laughs> we sit in the office, Max. How do I get this folder to open? And you're like, oh, you again? <laughs> <laughs> no, I love it because it's always some something so blindingly simple, but that you would never. Oh, you just right click it and then I hate drag Premier it there. Pro. Premiere Pro can get in. <laughs> it was designed by Satan himself. <laughs> Bro, After Effects is way worse. I don't even want to start. Um, we're kind of ticking all my little boxes here. Another random sort of topic that I was gonna ask you about was nose breathing. I know that's completely off the wall, but ah. how much of how much? Why did but, we speak about this? I would. I listened to a podcast. No, we didn't speak about this. All but right. I listened to a podcast, and it was breaking. It might have even been that. Um. Feel better, live more, you know, like okay, that no, really I'm big not. one. No. Um. So he was. They were talking about nose breathing and, and having... mouth breathing on a podcast or something. <laughs> <laughs> um. And how much better it is, and for like filtration of mm. of your of your oxygen and stuff like that. So when I'm out running, I'm doing all my inhales at least through my nose. I struggle to get it out through my nose enough at the moment. But yeah, all my in, all my inhales. <laughs> I are know my you nose. do. So, funnily you say this, a guy that I work with called Adrian, his partner is called Sarah, and she is, I think, a chiropractor, and she's been researching nose breathing. I don't know what the technical term for it is. And I think that's it, nose breathing. <laughs> it's it. Breathing through your nose, yeah. Classic. <laughs> Um, and I actually went for like a, a consultation because she wanted to, she was trying to get a lot of people to to go through like this kind of trial period to see if it, it made dif- a difference to your performance. And I really regret that I didn't really, to be honest, practice what she'd asked me to practice because I think it was just a bad time in my life. I'm a bit of a yes man. So when she asked, oh, would you be interested in taking part in this trial of this nose breathing thing that I'm researching? I was like, yeah, it sounds sick. It just wasn't the right time for me. So I'm sorry, Sarah. But the stuff that she was saying about nose breathing was mind blowing. Apparently a lot of footballers have implemented this at a very high level. And the like the oxygen saturation that you get from breathing through your nose instead of your mouth is ridiculous. It's a lot better uptake of oxygen, even mm. though it feels to your intuition it's, like you're getting less. You somehow. feel like you're suffocating. Feel you like ever you're try like so go on your next mountain bike pedal. Try and just breathe through your nose. It's savage. And I don't think I fully bought into it, to be honest, as well. It's probably 
one of the factors why I stopped practicing but maybe when my schedule's a little bit hectic less hectic and I have the capacity to think about breathing through my nose which sounds ridiculous but there's a huge thing with sleep mm. so my, my my girlfriend and I started uh, taping our mouth shut because if you breathe no through your way. nose when you sleep you don't wake up with a dry mouth and you're also better rested because you've been getting better oxygen sure right? So we <laughs> actually just to come into your bedroom. Right? <laughs> just got up. Up. What the hell? Well, are you a guys... hostage situation. <laughs> what are you guys into? <laughs> um, but like for her, it was difficult because she's a she breathes through her mouth. But I discovered that I actually breathe through my, my nose naturally when I okay. sleep. So that's great. But I didn't, you know, I didn't do anything to do that. But during activity, I've been trying to do it just because. Yeah, I, I, we're not going to be able to give you any hard science. No, on I'm this, afraid on this not. Podcast. But um, look into it. It's an interesting topic. It is interesting. Mm. So I was just wondering if that was a thing that you. No, were... it's not something I've consciously practiced, but there's definitely gains to be made. Yeah, I'm running out of written down topics. Is there anything that you like? Kind of thought that we would maybe chat about on your way over here on the drive. <laughs> uh, I thought we would talk about Reese and I's relationship at college a little bit more. We could unpack it a little not bit to, Not to bring it up, but it was just when Reese was talking about how super competitive he was, and man, it was it was it was eye opening because I'd never known anybody to be like that. Like obviously his dad holding him by the shoulders and like you're gonna go and fucking win, son. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair play, well, but my parents are not like that, eh? And I don't think, I think, yeah, we were very different people, Reese and I. But when we were at college, it was definitely like we're out to get each other. And it was motivating as hell. But Reese is the only person I've ever had like a physical altercation with, as he told you about it. No. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> More details. This is your soundbite for Instagram. Yes. I had a fight with Reese Wilson. <laughs> I don't know if you'll remember. <laughs> to be fair, it was we were very young, and it was over a girl, and he was holding hands with my girl in the club. <laughs> and I remember getting furious. I was like, "What the fuck?" And I grabbed him like this. What the fuck are you doing? And then we got chucked out <laughs> from the club, and. Uh, it's water under the bridge now, but oh man, <laughs> that is amazing. <laughs> amazing. So Such like idiot kids, eh? Yeah, yeah. Just ah, oh, so much testosterone just getting thrown about the place. <laughs> so like, yeah, it extended beyond just like way base. beyond being competitive on the bikes. It was everything, and I think I uh, like I respect Reece so much for where he's gone and what he's done with his his career and hopefully he feels the same way but it's just funny hey eh? <laughs> don't fight it's the only fight i've ever been in i wouldn't even class it as a fight it was a wee tussle but i've never been physical like that with anybody and i would hate to be like that with anybody again but bants <laughs> <laughs> so yeah that's a brilliant sound bite, by the way it's incredible um so like on on base can you maybe just like unpack the sort of com the 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 competitiveness there and how that was how that helped you both really i don't think it helped me <laughs> <laughs> i'm the same as you i'm not like i'm not that competitive i'm not with like other that people. i'm not people. bar to bar and it was annoying because like we were going to a situation and reese would be like at someone would and he always like, try and like what not one up you because he's i don't think he's like that but he's just like always make it a competition and that's I've had that my entire life with Reese, <laughs> and like he, he, so if you if you beat him, there were some some instances when we were younger where like there was a video game, it was like a motocross game, mm -hmm. and it was his game. Yeah. So I went round to his house one one evening, and we're sat playing this game, and I beat him, and he fucking chucked me out of his house. <laughs> <laughs> to get him out. It's insane, isn't it? Like to me, that's insane. But fair play, you man. To deal passionate. With it. Yeah, it's amazing, and. If you know that it's kind of, it's not, like, yes, he's being competitive, but it's also not that serious. Yeah. Like, he's going to turn things into a competition, but it's 
it doesn't mean anything at the end of the day. He's just doing it because that's like it's all he knows. his energy, you know. Hmm. But yeah, I'm the same as you. So I would get dragged into these like situations where, like, I didn't, I didn't want to like be competitive with this other person. And like, I'm rolling with Reese kind of, so I'm perceived as being on Reese's side. Hmm. So then people wouldn't be talking to me because like, oh, he's Reese's mate. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. <sighs> <laughs> I don't have anything to say about that That's anymore. brilliant. Uh, the the sound bite is next level. Or... Can we just shout out Rab Burdell? Rest in peace, Rab Burdell. Mm. Mm. Legend. Did you go to his funeral? No, I, I, that fucked me up again. Like, I wasn't even <laughs> It was nice, man. There. Was yeah. it? Yeah, it was really good. Yeah. And uh, there's a new trail that's been built at the Golfy that's been named after Rab. It's called Wardell's Way. Uh, I think that's a sick way to remember somebody, especially someone like Rab, who just loved the valley and loved riding bikes. I'm gonna get emotional. <laughs> so, yeah, that that ruined me because we were out in Leger and it was just like it's a weird thing where you're like, kind of just in your own bubble or whatever, and then mm. you hear something like that and you're like, what? I've, I've never, never had someone s- that's been that influential in my life pass away yet. Mm. I think we're luckily not quite at that age to be honest and rab to pass when he was 37 was he 30 i think 37 or or thereabouts like oh that's real life in it yeah it's gnarly man Mm. anyway sorry to bring the mood down no no it's that was something that i thought about as well i like i guess we've not really spoken about rab's role in my life and his association with dirt school and just how epic he was as a dude but man you can go and search rab Burdell on google you find some sick stuff he used to work for dirt school the company that i'm with now and well you've worked with the man yeah well he was coaching the same year as me and reese were on the mm-hmm. course mm-hmm. and he was always the guy that was like there was andy that would kind of give you the the discipline and rab would almost like sneak to the back and would be your mate yeah. you know so rab was totally equal with you mm-hmm. and uh it was just always just his laugh was so infectious <laughs> man his laugh was incredible and uh yeah i fortunately got to do the wahoo project um uh, mm-hmm. old enough to know better which is online and uh it made it all the more emotional because mm-hmm. like to make a film like that you have to just kind of insert yourself into their life for a bit so went to see his parents his parents house yeah. so now i've got this image of of it all like how he grew up hmm. and the place that he grew up and the, the stair sets that he used to ride down when mm. he was younger and stuff and yeah we you were on that shoot as well shooting yeah. photos and stuff yeah, like that Rob. so it was also recent yeah and it would have been um they were filming a second series as well um and i think they had just finished filming a second series really with the same world so okay that would have been really hard for those guys you know mm. i don't know what the etiquette is about talking about funerals but i'm sure rab would appreciate this at his funeral katie his girlfriend put on a recording of rab singing i didn't know he could sing or play guitar and it was amazing it was like three minutes of him singing a song to katie and at the end his voice cracked and it went all a bit bit shit and that's what he said he was like well that went a bit shit at the end didn't it and what like everybody just started laughing and crying at the same time because it was just just went a bit shit at the end didn't it but yeah it was a really 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 nice way to remember rab but yeah thoughts go out to katie and his family it's real life c'est la vie it's like yeah it was appreciate it was one of those it was like appreciate every day man yeah yeah yeah, no, I, that is a good, that's, <laughs> can we bring the mood up before we <laughs> sign off? Because that's brutal. Um, we could sort of sign off by hmm. giving people a little bit of a projection for what you're, what to look out for, for the, for the future from Ennis Graham Limited Co. <laughs> Script. Actually, that you might be ready working to do my tax me. return. <laughs> what? I need to do my self-assessment. Oh. <laughs> I need to do mine as well. <laughs> I love paying tax. It's my favourite thing. Uh, what can you? I'm just gonna keep ticking my boxes, do my thing. I'm loving coaching at the moment. My plan for this year is to. I'm sadly not gonna race the first two 
EDR races now they're, as they're referred to in Tasmania. It's just too much of an expense and I don't feel like I'm going to be physically fully prepared for those races. But I have full support and we're working on funding for me to be at the rest of the whole season, um, which is fantastic. I'm going to be able to take some more goals and try and climb the ranks. I'd love to be in the top 20 overall this year because I was just outside it because I broke my hand at Ludenville. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I guess that's a big goal is just like learn what it takes to be a consistent EWS or EDR rider. For the for the for the sake of my own motivation and also the kids that we're coaching day in day out I think for them having somebody that's performing at that level is super valuable just as it was for me when I was racing downhill on college Roy was that guy that was like I want to be like you and without Roy I probably wouldn't have got to the point that I was satisfied with in downhill so if I can show the the base students that we have every year that you're in the best place, you've got all the resources, we're doing the same training basically, <coughs> go and get it. Bones men, press send. <coughs> Don't break bones. <laughs> Sucks. <laughs> That's sick. Well, I hope you can you can document at least some of it. Honestly, if it's just a raw GoPro, <coughs> that's all I need. That's, I okay. just need. To... Appreciate it. The motivation's there, so we're just gonna start uploading to YouTube. Perfect. We'll see. All right. That'll Cheers, do. brother. Yeah. Episode two. That was fun, eh? Lick it, stamp it, send it. <laughs> <laughs> Done. Yeah. Cheers. Peace out. <laughs> I never know how to end them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>